Research into so-called designer babies is gathering pace. A US firm says a surrogate mother's pregnant with an embryo where genes have been edited and the baby will have a reduced risk of getting 11 potentially fatal diseases. We'll hear from one expert who says this is all highly desirable. Others here will say the risks are too great, both to the baby and society. Welcome to Roundtable. Hello and welcome to the programme from me, David Foster. The concept of genetically modified children is unacceptable, in some eyes, playing dangerously with nature. But it is happening. The question is whether good intentions could go horribly wrong. Once thought of as science fiction, genetically modified babies could become a reality within the next generation. Scientists have argued that the process could stop children from inheriting diseases or chronic conditions, with one researcher claiming an ethically sound attempt could happen within two years. New technology known as CRISPR has allowed scientists to change sequences of DNA. The edited genetic traits would be inherited by future generations. But critics have warned against a race to create superior children, the results of early research show the expected advantages to be relatively small, with IQ increasing by only three points on average and height increasing by three centimeters. The process would also be expensive and unpredictable. One controversial aspect of gene editing is the potential to introduce changes to the germline, where one alteration could affect all other cells and be passed on to future generations. So how close are we to editing out genetic imperfections through children? And should we even try? Very pleased to say that with me at the round table, we have Dr. Kalpana Surendranath, who's a molecular cell biologist. Sarah Chan, also here too, director of the Mason Institute for Medicine, Life Sciences and the Law at the University of Edinburgh. We go to Dundee, also in Scotland, but on the line from there, we have Dr. Kevin Smith, bioethicist at Abate University and from the United States, Natalie Koffler, founding director of Editing Nature, currently at the University of Illinois. Great to have you all along. Uh, Kevin, let me come to you first. I, I know you don't like the phrase designer babies, and we'll get to why and what that means later on in the program, but in layman's terms, for our viewers, for me, explain how this works. Well, using essentially the techniques of in vitro fertilization, um, human embryos are dealt with in the proverbial te uh, petri dish and um, we have certain biomolecules introduced to those embryos that will target our chosen gene sequences, alter those gene sequences as we require, which can either involve um, in situ editing of the sequences or indeed bringing in new sequences to our chosen target location within the genome. So what it means is that, let's say, there's a history in the family of five, six, seven, eight hereditary diseases or diseases that an offspring would be likely to develop. You can remove the chances of that baby developing those, perhaps so that they never get them? Well, that would be a longer-term aspiration. Initially, one more realistically would work with individual genes, but certainly... Um, Gene editing technology does offer the, the promise of being able to modify multiple positions within the genome, which would indeed mean um, several genes being altered in one embryo. But that is more in the future. So you could end up with uh, what some might describe as the perfectly healthy human. I don't really think that there is such a thing. OK, well, let's, let's, let's look at this broadly. Um, technically, we know it is possible now, don't we? What, what are the moral objections to this? What, what could go wrong? So we know in theory it's possible and it's been claimed that babies have been born as a result of genome editing, but what we don't know is if that's worked and how well it's worked. So at the moment, the scientific consensus is very strongly that quite apart from 
any broader concerns. At the moment, we don't yet understand the science. We don't yet understand the risks well enough to proceed to clinical application. What, what are the risks? Uh, is it that um, the embryo, when it becomes a young person, if it is delivered in a healthy fashion, could, could get these diseases in a worse way or yes. what? So it might be the case that the intended genome edit, the intended repair that you make to the mutation doesn't work. Uh, if that's the only thing that you're goes no worse wrong... Off. Exactly, you're no yeah. worse off. But there's also the chance that you might inadvertently introduce other mutations into the genome, and we don't know what the effects of those so might be. So why are be. people doing it? I think the hope is that we're going to be able to develop these techniques to be able to be used in a safe way to cure disease, to improve health. I think people are very keen to, to get to that point. Yeah. And so perhaps they're, they're rushing into this because they are enthusiastic, they would perhaps like to be the first, and they have no idea of the consequences. Exactly. This tool, CRISPR, is sort of a double-edged sword. It has Explain great... to everybody what that is. Yeah, so it this has This is the great... gene editing tool. Yeah, the teen gene editing tool, the CRISPR tool, is nothing but a large protein and a snippet of RNA, which, carry, which is carried inside the human cell, inside the nucleus, and then cutting uh, the DNA at the desired location. We don't understand neither the tool completely nor the um, instruction book, the genome completely. Uh, less than 1% of the human genome only is understood so far by us. And there's no question of sending this tool into the master cell, the embryo, and editing it. So it's um, like going into the most complicated engine in the, in the world, knowing only one thing uh, that might happen. Yeah, it is difficult to predict the outcomes of sending this tool into the master cell that is responsible yeah. for creating trillions of cells of the human body. Okay. Natalie, I'll come to you in just a second, but I want to throw something back at Kevin, if I may. If all of this is where we stand at the moment, why on earth is it, as you say, uh, highly desirable and ethically justifiable? Yes, I mean, one must be cautious in... Um, well, it's scientifically correct to describe the embryo as the master cell. I have no quibble with that. But um, our genomes are in no way perfect, which is something that, unfortunately, many of those who are dead set against the whole concept of human uh, germline interventions tend to claim. Our genome is, to some extent, a lash-up that has been brought to us from various evolutionary events, and including chance events. Um, it does not equip us very well for the diseases that tend to strike us in the later post-reproductive years for, for good evolutionary reasons. Um, so there is nothing conceptually wrong with actually trying to improve the human genome. Uh, moreover, uh, it would be very wrong to see the human genome within a given embryo. As but, it, but is it not a Pandora's box? Is, is it not something that is being opened without actually knowing what is inside. Last one for you, then I, then I will come to Natalie. And I know you want to say something, Sarah, but we've got to bring in Natalie into the programme. It, 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 with the, 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 the human genome within the embryo is subject to many random new mutations in each and every one of us when we're at that embryo stage. So we have this background of mutations happening already. What I'm proposing is that we use carefully well-conceived science to go in and alter clearly deleterious sequences. Natalie, I know you may want to comment on the scientific side of this, but let's talk about the moral argument at this point and, and your concerns that it's frightening when we move into areas of enhancement or correcting perceived disabilities. In other words, somebody else is deciding what is right in a human and what is wrong. Yes, exactly. And I think it becomes quite clear about, you know, really, the, the, there's actually a moral obligation to explore gene editing if it can help reduce debilitating disease and be used as a therapeutic. It becomes much more complicated um, when we talk about correcting perceived disabilities and trying to, um, you know, create people in the vision of what our society has decided is normal or in even some cases uh, supreme. And so, for example, right now there's discussions of uh, research going on in Russia in, in, uh, with a doctor hoping to correct a heritable version of deafness in human embryos. And this has um, garnered quite a lot of conversation, um, particularly in the deaf community, uh, where there's a real feeling of um, not being seen as fully human already and beautiful in, the, in their own way and um, trying again to correct mm. 
people into a vision of the very narrow folks that are actually doing research um, to fit sort of this idea of, again, what's, what's normal and to sort of engineer the human to fit into a society that yeah. already is an equitable. It is somebody else's view of what makes the perfect human, which is in its, in its own ways eugenics. And we've seen in the 20th century what happens when you start to, to deal in what people conceive to be the perfect, perfect human being. I mean... Yeah, yeah, come in, Kevin. You can sometimes be bogged down in using words that have just been used, such as perfect and, of course, the, the word eugenics, which harks back to a, a horrific episode. Um, However, I think we have to be careful and we have to be realistic about this. Um, it, it is, of course, there are debates to be had when the technology becomes good enough to um, alter perhaps subtleties of human functioning. Of course, there will be ethical debates to be had about that. But when it comes down to uh, preventing major disorders, then I think the, the, the ethical argument is very clear. If we can do it with safety, and by safety I mean the, 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 the benefits outweighing the, the downsides and the risks, then I certainly think that we should go ahead. There's nothing sacrosanct about the human genome that, that suggests that we, we, we shouldn't. Um, when it comes to correcting disabilities, I think we have to be realistic. There are certain conditions that everything else be equal, we do want to avoid, and most reasonable people would want to avoid them in their children. Well, that, and and that, Kalpana, I sorry, sorry, Kevin, I've just got to stop you for a second. That, that, that's a reasonable argument. Yes. Uh, the other counter-arguments to that are that it, it could go wrong, it could fall into the wrong hands, and not enough research has been done to take it, take it forward. Where do we stand in controlling this and investigating it in a proper way so that it doesn't go wrong? Yeah, so clearly such uh, initiatives involve a lot of money. So you can imagine um, this being accessible only to the wealthy and not the needy. So there is this question of social inequality here. So unless, Which in itself is a form of eugenics, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, because unless... It that, uh, only those people who consider themselves to be perfect are able to do this or want to be perfect, and, and the poorer people... I, I will come to you, Kevin. Yeah. We need gl tight global regulations to regulate these procedures, and uh, there is a huge gap at the moment in terms of regulations. We don't have tight regulations at the moment. The UK is pretty strict about it, isn't it? Yes, of course. But what about elsewhere? Because I mentioned in the very at the very beginning of the program, the United States, a company there saying that there is a surrogate mother. There's uh, a lot of gray which, areas. Yeah. Whose embryo has been genetically edited. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, uh, gray areas. UK has a gold standard and in terms of strictly regulating GM-related stuff. But, uh, modification. Uh, but uh, any elsewhere in the world when such thing happens, there's no control on how fast this can spread to the other parts of the globe. So. Um, unless there are tight regulations in place. Uh, em embryo editing in particular, I believe, uh, that should not be attempted. Sarah, you're an ethicist. I mean, it's all very well to, to talk about ethics, but there are unethical people out there who will want to take this and use it to their own ends. So I think one of the challenges is how do we achieve responsible global governance and what is it we're trying to prevent? So I think we almost all agree that what has been done trying to take it to clinical application to create genetically modified humans at this stage is unethical, partly because of the risks it poses, but also because it's going against the scientific consensus. It's going against the um, social discourse at the moment, which is about let's take it slowly, let's work out how to do this. And that in itself, I think, you know, forging ahead against that and saying, I don't care, I'm going to do it anyway and be first. I think is unethical and irresponsible in, in many ways. So at the moment you asked uh, where are we in terms of the regulation and in terms of working towards safe and responsible science. Uh, there are various international movements uh, afoot at the moment. Uh, so the WHO, for example, has a working group that is trying to look at what would be required for responsible governance. Uh, there is an international commission of the National Academies of Sciences uh, that is looking at what is the pathway towards responsible translation. So we need to take all of these things step by step. Natalie, let me come to you on this one. Editing nature. Uh, clearly, you started that because you, you wanted to spark a wider debate about this, among other things, that is going on. Where does the conversation have to go next? I think we need to really unpack uh, this word we. 
So that's been used a lot already this morning. And I think we need to remember that at the end of the day, it's a pretty narrow slice of humanity that's making pretty large decisions about how gene editing should be used, how it's being developed, how it should be regulated. For example, Sarah just mentioned the international commissions that have been formed both at the WHO as well as there's a partnership between the National Academies of Sciences in the US as well as the Royal Society in the UK um, to try and cre create sort of global guidelines around germline gene editing. There's not a single person that identifies as having a physical disability on either of those commissions. They're largely dominated from people of the global north. Um, they're largely uh, people who are white. Um, there's women, there's good gender equity, but I think we could do a lot better of making sure that these decisions are really more collectively defined and that we're amplifying and including um, diverse voices and steering how the te this technology will be used. At the end of the day, it has the potential to shape uh, the human gene pool and the arc of human evolution and who's, again, whose ideas of of perfection and normalcy and what kind of world of uh, future world are we are we creating and whose vision of that is being created with human gene editing? Okay, Kevin, and, and I know you want to say something, Sarah, and, and after this it will be open to anybody to say anything at any time. What is wrong with the phrase designer babies? Because that is what you're getting, isn't it? You are getting something that you have decided is what you want. Well, as I said a short time ago, there's lots of language around this issue that um, tends to be potentially misleading, a little bit sloppy. I, I mean, I don't really know what a designer baby literally means. It's very imprecise, but it certainly conjures up um, something from a kind of dystopian future. When I speak to most people about it, they tend to think about very tall, blonde individuals with blue eyes. And so therefore it's, it's harking back straight to the eugenics argument. But I think we have to push the debate on. We, we shouldn't be dwelling in, in buzzwords and the deep propaganda terms. We should be looking at the underlying concepts and asking uh, when should we be pushing ahead with this rather than um, scaring ourselves with uh, words like perfecting and eugenics and designer babies. Okay, Sarah. So that's my objection to the terminology. Uh, so I want to go further. I think the term designer babies isn't just vague or sloppy. I actually think it's quite disrespectful. So when you hear the word designer, what do you think of? Handbags, shoes. I contrast that with the families of patients and the patients who have come to me to say, I've heard about this new technology. I have this disease in my family. When can we have a cure? So we're talking about people here who are suffering, they're ill, they're hoping that something's going to help them. They're hoping for a healthy family. And to equate that kind of hope with the idea of buying a new okay, handbag so is it, just... It's lazy, perhaps, but is it, is it designed to, to put an end to the argument, to dismiss what is happening as, I, as wrong? Yes, I think it is exactly that, and it is therefore very dismissive and hence disrespectful of the families who are hoping that this technology is going to benefit them one day. Also, scientifically, designer baby is a hoax. It's like a sci-fi idea. Because uh, so you don't trades... accept, sorry, you don't accept what I said, which is you are designing something that or somebody that you want. You are changing the original and getting what you want. That is design. It is not possible to get what you want in most cases. Is my point because traits such as height and intelligence, for example, which is most desirable by society, and also talked about when they use this particular term. Uh, are not controlled by just one or two genes. They are controlled by hundreds of genes. And uh, how is it possible to ever edit hundreds of genes in such a vulnerable system like a human embryo? So that's totally out of question. OK, uh, Kevin mentioned a dystopian uh, vision of, of this. You talk about how it's difficult at the moment to do anything other than just a I mean, few. It's, it's but just, we've seen it's what has happened in the world of computing, where something that used to take five minutes now takes a millionth of a second. It is quite possible, is it not? Yeah that within yeah. a very short period of time, advances would have been made that mean that those two genes go up exponentially to 100 million genes that can be edited in five minutes. Yeah, it's not now. I mean, we now. can't but do it you now. Don't, you don't dismiss it, do you? Uh, we can't do it now. And we didn't imagine CRISPR um, 10 years back. CRISPR is here. I'm, I can't imagine what's going to happen in, um, another 100 years, but it's not now. We are not ready now. We cannot claim anything now. OK. Natalie, and I know, Sarah, you've got so much to say. I wish we had more time. Natalie, isn't that one of the dangers? We don't know what is going to happen in, in the future. You, you could be able to completely remap and redesign... Sorry for the use of the word design. Uh, ..reorder what is happening in an embryo 
uh, within a short period of time if advances continue at pace as they, as they have done up till now? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I agree completely that, you know, these ideas of improving these multi-genetic traits um, like intelligence or, as, or height, which was mentioned, we can't do it now, but we need to have the conversations now. And we know that from what happened last year with these gene edited uh, babies that were born in China, you know, there were conversations that were had, but perhaps they didn't go far enough at the time when we got into the situation that we have now, presumably to genetically modified children born. Um, so I think the conversation does need to happen now. I also want to address something that Kevin said um, in that it is very important, I think, that we reach into the past when we're thinking about what we're going to be doing now and in the future with gene editing. There are histories of gross inequity in the vulnerable populations being treated horribly by the medical community and research community, including those with disabilities, those people of color, people in less developed economies. And we need to really um, acknowledge those past um, uh, actions, which have created quite a lot of distrust, and think about ways that in moving forward, again, we create more inclusive decision-making processes so vulnerable people can be part of... Yeah, um, yeah and the vulnerable don't then become more vulnerable uh, exactly. as a result of this. Kevin, I'll come back to you in just a moment, but I, I, I want to give Sarah the chance because you, you were desperate to say something. So I wanted to say something about the role of regulation. So you're right, science might get to the point where we can edit hundreds of genes in one go in order to try to influence much more complex traits like intelligence or like appearance. But regulation has a role to play. If we think that parents should be able to make choices that lead to better health for their children, but we don't want them to be able to engineer other other sorts of characteristics, regulation can draw a line between what we think is acceptable and what isn't. And so... And since you're an ethicist, there are the, as I mentioned earlier, the unethical out there who would ignore these regulations. Uh, well, so let's look at, for example, at the UK. Uh, people said exactly the same when we introduced what we call pre-implantation genetic testing, which is using IVF together with genetic testing in order to help parents have a healthy child. And people said, you allow this one day, next thing you're going to be selecting for everything under the sun. And that hasn't happened because we have regulation. In fact, people haven't tried to do it here. So the key, I think, is achieving effective regulation. And I think absolutely what Natalie has said about mm. how do we get global regulation that is truly inclusive of diverse perspectives, yeah. okay. truly Ke global. Ke Kevin, Kevin, I hope you don't think we've been painting you as a bit of a villain in this, but I have, have to put some of these points to, to okay. a scientist in this regard. And I would get, like to get your take on how commonplace this is going to be. So, in terms of likelihood, well, uh, it, it, futurology is a very difficult uh, task to, to, to engage with, and it's something that I wouldn't want to get into. But I think that your general point about the analogy with computing is a very apposite one. Things that for initially seemed impossible or took forever now can be done in the blink of an eye. And um, additionally, the analogy with computing can, can be um, extended to an, a, an earlier point about only rich individuals being able to afford this. Uh, that was exactly the same with computing, where a few decades ago we had just a handful of computers mm. in the entire world. Now there's one in just about every home. There's probably about so five in this studio. Uh, just, just a quick one, because we haven't got very much more time. Uh, Natalie, is this the only way uh, to deal with disease-associated genes in embryo, or are there other ways? I mean, well, we're already dealing with some inheritable diseases in embryos through um, pre-implantation genomics, where embryos are screened prior to being implanted after performing IVF, and then either implanted if they're free of disease or not. So there are some ways to eliminate certain disease already that might be inherited from one of the parents if it's important for them to have biological children. Um, however, there are some genetic cases where it is going to be challenging, for example, if both parents are the carrier of a disease, or if there's certain diseases like Huntington's, where it only requires one copy of the, mm. of the mutation in, to cause the disease, um, and if both parents have it. Um, so, I, I, And I'm not a, um, in any way opposed to this technology continuing to be developed. I think it's incredibly important, and I'm really excited by the potential that it does have to to treat a lot of diseases. I just think we need to be really careful about who's making those choices, who's, who's deciding what the regulations look like, and who's actually in the, in the lab doing the research. Okay, we have a Natalie, lot of thank you, thank you. Look, we've got just about a minute or so to, to finish this up. Without wanting to put words in Natalie's mouth, there was a comma, but. And what are your <laughs> big buts about this? Kalpana, you first. Yeah, I would like to talk the 
good side of this uh, as well, because uh, uh, where we are closer to reality is treating the single, uh, single gene related disorders. Disease in a dish is more closer to reality than designer babies is my view. Okay, and Sarah, Sarah, your but, you know, it's a great idea, it's, it's inevitable, but... So one of the big concerns has been about equity and social justice, and I think a lot of people worry that this technology is going to worsen e existing inequities. I would turn that around and I would say these existed before genome editing. If we don't do anything, they're going to exist after genome editing. In other words, genome editing is not the problem. Could it provide a solution? So rather than saying, should we stop genome editing in case it makes social inequity worse, we should be saying, how can we use these technologies to address existing inequities and make the world a better okay, place? Listen, thank you very much indeed. I am a very lucky man to be able to sit here and talk to four of you about an absolutely fascinating subject that will affect, if not my children, that future generations quite considerably, I, I would suggest. The world may well look a very different place in 100 years' time. Uh, round table may still be here, but I can assure you I won't. Uh, I may be here next week. From me, David Foster, from the team, from my guests, thank you for watching. Goodbye for now. <laughs>